In this episode, we'll be talking about why we shouldn't design for an ideal end state. We'll be talking about the economics of service design and finally, how companies can use services as their ultimate differentiator. And here's the guest for this episode. Hi, this is Idris Muti. Welcome to the Service Design Show. If you're trying to design services that have a positive impact on people and are good for business, then you've come to the right place. Hi all, I'm Mark Fontaine and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this channel, you get the chance to learn why some services fail and others succeed. For that, we go beyond the usual tools and methods and talk about topics like design thinking, customer experience, organizational change, and creative leadership. So if you want to take your service design skills to the next level, and you haven't done that already, I'd love to have you to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any episode that is coming out. My guest in this episode is Idris Muti. Idris is the CEO of Idea Couture, and he's the writer of several books, including Design Thinking for Strategic Innovation, and we'll be giving away a signed copy of that book here on this episode, so make sure you stick around to the end. In the next 30 minutes or so, Idris and I will be talking about why we shouldn't be designing for an ideal end state. We'll be talking about the economics of service design, and finally, how companies can use services as their ultimate differentiator. So that was it for the introduction, and now let's quickly jump into the interview with Idris. Welcome to the show, Idris. Hi. So uh, first of all, the thing people will notice is the paintings behind you. What are those? Those are my paintings, my um, you know, post-impressionist and some of the surrealistic painting that I have. And you said something really nice uh, before we started the show, and it's they help you to keep the noise out, right? Yeah, it's a, it's sort of part of my um, uh, part of my multitasking. Sometimes when I'm on a conference call with fifty people talking, <laughs> and I can just sort of doing that with my right hand and PowerPoint with my left hand. Mm, that's that's a quite an interesting skill. Idris, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everyone uh, who gets on the show, and that is, do you remember the very first time you got in touch with service design? Do you recall that moment? I think so. I think probably about 20-something years back when, um, when we were working with a client on, on a UX um, strategy for a completely new business, and, and they realized that there was so much um, considerations need to be part of that, and they decided to call it sort of the team decided to call it sort of service design. Uh, but then, but then we we're the people that involved were either traditional business analysts and uh, UX folks. So most people don't have an idea what it means. They know that it's a gap, that something needs to be done, but there's no formal methodology or approach or process to do it. And people just try to figure out, okay, so the implication is what's going to happen. There's a gap here. So the best you can do is create a gap analysis. But there's no dedicated team yeah. or service designer can actually look at this and handle this problem. Before we dive into that, so it was 20 years ago, uh, around the, the dot-com boom, that you, you got into service design, right? That the term started to... Something along, around the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I think still a lot of people up till today uh, enter the field like it's something completely new, but it has been around for quite some time, right? And it, it dates back to even prior to that. So it's, it's new, but then again, it depends on, on your background, I guess. Right, I guess, I guess it's been around, but I don't think it's, I think even up to today, even though there are service designers, there are service design firms, but I don't think it's a formal discipline that mm. actually um, people recognize much as you are a, you know, you're an architect, you're a UX designer, you're exactly. a... Yeah. So it's still a very kind of a self-organized discipline yeah. that responded to market needs rather than top-down, like this is a profession. And uh, people are still debating, is it a field, is it a profession, is it a methodology, what is it? Anyway, we're not going to go into that because we can fill three hours with that topic. We have much yeah. more interesting topics to talk about. Because you gave me three, I gave you some question starters, and we're going to co-create the questions and the topics we'll be talking about. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. All right, let's, let's do this. 
First topic uh, is called designers thinking in an ideal state. Do you have a question starter? And you have one paper, uh, right? Okay. <laughs> so, so how far? How far? So, yes. Um, What's the question? Yeah. Sorry. What, so what what question can you make uh, out of this? How far? Well, I think it's the. Can you put it up again? I forgot. Oh your no! It's it's designers thinking in an ideal state. That's yes, the, I think most people look at this is um, this is where we are today. This is the ideal state where we ha we identify customer needs, and um, so we want to close the gap. So sort of ten things, yeah. fifty things we want to do better. Yeah. Um, that currently causing pain or inconvenience for customers. So that's kind of like the approach. But I don't think that's right. I don't think it should be there's an ideal state. There may be some interim milestones because customer service, service design, customer experience is constantly evolving. People are changing because of maturity of certain products, and market shifting, um, technology is moving, and there's more getting into the ecosystems and holds a lot of reasons. And so, so when people look at service design, they should not look at it as a kind of simple future state and the current state. Like the before and after situation, that's not... It, no, exactly. It, it no. doesn't reflect reality. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It should be a continuous state of um, improving the experience and understanding which are the... Because some require longer term fixing, some can be pretty simple quick fix. And some require some radical change, and any radical change requires a lot of executional um, consideration. So, so it should not be a state where this is in, this is out, we're going to yeah. do this, it's impossible to do this. Those impossible uh, pieces, is maybe it's part of this effort to make them possible. Mm -hmm. So, And you can't have an end state and say, look, these are the 20 things we want to do, but 19 things we cannot do, and that's the end state. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm really curious because there are two parties here. Like we have the design community who might be thinking in an end state kind of way, but it might also be clients who buy into the service design thing. Uh, what needs to happen at both sides to change this towards a more continuous kind of way of working? Yeah, so what I do designers need to do different and what do clients need to do different? Well, I think, I think it's a very good question. I think the starting point is important. I think most people started with a, not have, either they don't have an idea of what is needed or they have a few specific idea of fixing a few pain points. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're talking about fixing a few small things, then you can have an easy end state episode, but that's more of a technical basis. But you are thinking about, well, we're going to introduce service design as becoming part of a key competitive advantage or even service design is the sole core of this company, that's what we do, then you should not have an end state. Then you should think about, well, what is the core driver of customer service experience um, in our industries? And, and what are the levers? And um, what are the key areas that we need to absolutely have to, have to make some trade off? Um, and one of the key areas that the industry simply accept that you can't do this. And then you go back and say, no, let's question that. You know, why not? Um, and if we do that, how would that change our experience design or service design? I think these are the questions. There are some strategic discovery needs to happen rather than like these are the, um, you know, five, ten pain points and these are the five, ten solutions. So that's, that's the, the call towards the design community that we should be challenging our clients to have more of these kind of strategic uh, discussions, right? And not accept that we're here to fix, to do the quick wins. Right, exactly. I think people need to understand what, why they do what they do rather than just what. I mean, there are some elements in, in that that, is, um, that you discover are uh, drivers of satisfaction. So there are they're not something that kind of make people wow, but it's something that you need to do uh, um, just to keep customer happy and keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And then there are drivers of differentiation where you look and think, well, that really help us to be very different and drastically change our value proposition and strengthen that. Now, that's become a much more strategic move. And you've got to do both, mm -hmm. but you need to have a plan and understand what is what.
Hmm. So, uh, and for me, I'm, I'm trying to imagine how can we help our clients make this transition, right? Because usually, uh, also clients are used to buying expertise and buying deliverables, buying quick wins. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have to position ourselves more as strategic designers, organizational designers, business designers? Should, should we embrace more of these kind of words? Um. I, I mean, I think that's uh, not that's not a simple answer for that. I mean, in an ideal world, I mean, yes, but in a, in the practical world, I think service designs are just learning to do their job well, because it's an industry where it's driven or advanced by the practitioners, not by academics, yeah, not yeah. by large companies, yeah, um, not by big consulting firms, because large firms come in and look at it, they, they take a different view. They look at sort of operational service re-engineering is really to optimize right costs and, and efficiency um and it's an, it, it's it's cost based um but you know service design is not only cost you try to bring into you harmonize a trade-off between cost customers and everything else mm -hmm. so it, it is it is implicating part of the organization design but i don't think currently the current state of service designers um I equip or should sort of take on too much. Yeah, that's, I, I can agree. And this is probably, um, I, I, again, I'm trying to imagine how, this, how we can facilitate this transition and transformation in the uh, community uh, much quicker. And we probably need some really good examples uh, of companies who are in this transition, right? Yes, um, because if you, if you look at how, I mean, the most common tool for service designer is what? Uh, service journey mapping, right, or customer journey. Sure. Mapping. Yeah. Everybody, does that. you know, you have you have a big spectrum of like, you know, one slide and five dots to like complete a room full of journeys and map and we and all know them. Yes. Yeah. We based know based them. on statistical data and ethnographic data and or some just random kind of ideas. You know, make up some happy here and here and here. Yeah. Now, I think I think that that tool is a starting point. But the tool needs to be much more sophisticated because you're looking at a customer view. So I think that's a good starting point. Now, doing it right is one thing. Doing it is still better than not doing it. Then, then that's only a customer view. And in order for you, a designer or strategist to make good recommendation, you have to look at the process view of the organization. Right? Any large organizations are like a machine. So there is a process view. Uh, there's a system view when you look at sometimes we're very complex financial products. There's a lot of external and regulatory. So we have a system view. And then where information comes, that's a data view. So by the time you bring everything together, you have a pretty good idea of um, why something needs to be done, cannot be done, why something that absolutely needs to be done. Um, but that's kind of like a more sophisticated um, way of doing mapping mm -hmm. and you get better results. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap up this topic uh, by saying what I've got out of this is that uh, we can we can look at the journey and look at the gaps and look at the end state, um, but maybe we should transform the transition uh, tra uh, uh, our discussion with clients in uh, towards much more. We sh how can we prevent these gaps from happening in the first place, right? How can we be proactive? How can we design a a customer experience and organization and structure that prevents these right. gaps from happening in the first place. That's maybe absolutely. I think the practical view is that by doing that, we're closing some gaps. Hmm. By doing that, and um, with some unintended consequences, we're opening new gaps because we <laughs> identify okay, these are the good stuff, and by the time the air operation folks take over and say, look, we're going to happen. Yes, we can automate it, automate it, automate it. And then you're realizing by doing that, you have a different sort of levels of gaps. Yeah. So, so this is a challenge. That's why it never, should not be simple and state. And the starting point should have operational consideration. Mm. Service design touch on many things. Uh, it touches on marketing, uh, the front end of that. It touches on um, operations, logistics. It touches on customer service, because usually customer service are entirely separate department handle customer complaint and service call. And operation is one separate entity. Some people actually outsource the whole operation to other logistic company. 
So, and without the full view of these things, you can design what you design, but you know, how, what you can impact is a different story. Mm -hmm. You already touched upon the word um, operations, and that is uh, the key of topic number two we're going to talk about. And let me put it in front of the people who are watching, um, and it's called the economics of operations. Do you have a question starter? Will it yes. be the it same or a different one? Very simple idea. How much? Because it's easy to. It's easy for anyone, it's easy to go in and say, I can see, from a customer point of view, I can see 50 things wrong. You walk into a hotel, you call in a service provider, you walk into retails and you order online. It's so easy to say that, you know, there are 50 things I want you to do. But it doesn't mean that as a business, I'll do those 50 things, because if I do all those 50 things, then most businesses will be out of business. Yeah. <laughs> So, so the idea is to really understand the economics of the business. Um, for example, we'd be, you know, take customer service. What is the expectation? It's easy to say that, okay, we want every customer to be happy. But let's be realistic. Not all companies can afford that, and they should. So how do you understand, like, what is sort of the service level? Mm. That, what level of service is required to get people happy? Um, and then you look at the variance of service failure that sometimes, you know, things mishap will happen. Um, what's acceptable? So there's some operational statistics to look at to identify the problem, right? Um, do you need 99% uptime or you need 80% uptime is fine. Um, and then you look at the um, interaction between human uh, machines and human. Um, you obviously want to automate as much as possible from an operational perspective. Um, you know, whether it's a call center, with the chat box, all of those things. You want to automate everything. But on the other hand, you want to humanize everything. And how do conflicts come in between operational and service design? And so how do you make the best of both with something that machine does really well? Let's use machine. And people do really well and use people or overlay a layer, a layer of a human service on top of um, machine, automation. So these are the things that service designer needs to think about, which um, traditionally people only look at, okay, you click here, you click here, your apps here. I mean, these are sort of much more simple problems to solve. Not that these problems are not real, but I think that most, that one is an easier problem to solve, considering a larger problem to solve. When I was thinking about this topic, a question that came to my mind is, hmm, as soon as I would introduce uh, economics and processes, I'm, I'm sort of limiting myself in what kind of solutions, insights uh, I, I might get. So it, at, at which stage should we introduce this perspective, the, the, this economics? perspective. How soon in the process should we start thinking about this? Well, I, I think you should start earlier. Now, I don't think they should sort of like, I think having an analyst working side by side with a service designer or team is a way better because you can save a lot of time coming up with lots of ideas. At the end of the day, they're just either simply you cannot execute it or B, it's not even worth doing it. There's no business case for yeah, it. Yeah. So having someone earlier to work on, but understanding the role is to not um, taking every constraint. I mean, still have to come in with a creative mind to say like, why is that? Is that constraint real? Um, can we overcome that? And how much does it cost to overcome that? And the service design team would say, well, if we can overcome this, it will drastically, radically change our business model. Then the constraint is worth sort of like overcoming. But there are some constraints like, okay, you overcome this constraint, it's a small little inconvenience and nobody cares. Um, so I think with the team together, understand the core drivers, the drivers uh, of either customer happiness that leads to loyalty or drivers of differentiation where it leads to innovation. Right? And, and so understand that is a very important starting point. Yeah, we should, what you're saying is we should have that uh, conversation as soon as possible. Correct. Yeah, I think that conversation should be 
part of the strategic discovery so that clients yeah. and yeah. everyone on the same page. Um, and, and these should be well documented as kind of like the project charter so okay. people understand the mission of that. Like if the mission is like, let's get get all the low hanging fruits and like make sure that we get out, get out, get rid of all the hiccups in, in, in the in the early sort of like in the service level. Let's do that. Or let's radically move certain systems over so that we have the ability to be more flexible to do a lot of things we always wanted to do because we did not have the right support back office system to do it. Now that's a different thing. So framing that in that way helped to understand scope and help to understand, you know, how much economic sort of implications that we are talking about. Okay. I think it's important to either to justify the business case and also any sort of um, the activities that require to uncover these things. Okay. Um, you again, you already touched upon something really important, and that is uh, differentiators, the e economic uh, uh, rationale behind services as differentiators, and that is the the title of topic number three. So let's just dive into that one. Um, here it is. I have it here in front of me. Service as a differentiator. Do you have a question okay. starter? Okay. So how can we do this? So how can we make services services as a differentiator? Yeah, I think most people are not seeing that. Most people are seeing that, look, let's do what we do to be up to par with our competition. And let's do it what right so that make it so easy to use. Um, and we benchmark our competition. And those are all good. But I think the biggest um, value for service design is like, how can we use that to create as as a core element for differentiation. Because if you look at most businesses today, you most people outsource their technology, their operations, uh, logistic, um, manufacturing, yeah, yeah. even. Yeah. So they pretty much kind of, we assemble it, we own the brand, we sell the products. Um, and, and that makes it very hard when everyone's subscribing to the same service. And you buy from the same manufacturers and use the same ERP systems and all of those things. So at the end of the day, every company wants to get out of the um, get out of the competitive kind of spectrum to become yeah. different. You have to do it very differently. So it comes from the human elements and emotive elements of designing. And service is a very powerful tool to create that connection. So and that when you start thinking about that, you have the most powerful tool to help you to create that connection. The number two reason is, is actually use that to change your business model. You look at some of the biggest tech companies today, um, you know, the Airbnb of the world, the, mm. you know, the Ubers of the world. I mean, they're technology companies, but I would argue that they're all service design companies. Mm. I mean, technologies are complicated, but not as complicated as others. But the whole idea of designing service and allow them to use the economics of, of people, you know, working part time and utilizing their homes, and these are all part of the service design. So you would argue that these are service design companies, they're not yeah. technology yeah. companies. And yeah. if you use an example, every company should rethink their business model and say, like, if we are a service design company, how would we do things differently? How would we operate differently? What asset do we want to keep? What asset we don't want? So, of course, I believe this. Everybody watching and listening uh, believes this. And now we get uh, onto board level. You, you, you do a lot of projects on board level. You meet CEOs, you meet uh, operational uh, chief operational officers. When you have this discussion with them, what is their biggest argument against this or the fear of, or why aren't they embracing this mindset? Well, I, you know, every large companies have their own dogmas. So they've been very successful operating that way for a long time. And, and most people don't see any idea to do something differently. Um, I think so that's kind of like the fear of change. I think that's normal human being. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years and now you tell me to do something differently. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Creating our assets and stuff like that and to, uh, designing our system to support this big machine and, and you 
change part of this big machine, it will have drastic implications. So you have an operational challenge and headache nobody wants to deal with. Uh, you have uncertainty over the risks because currently our business is very stable. We can kind of, to some degree, um, to some accuracy, we can kind of predict our earnings and which you know, large company needs to report earnings to, to uh, the street. And when you start embarking on something that's not proven, you suddenly realize that, wow, okay, that's too much risk. And, and board members and, and senior executives say, well, why are we taking that risk? When we are making earnings every month and we're doing well, and there's no reason to do that until someone comes in and shows, wow, look at that, it's threatening us. But by then, they look at that threatening us, either it's too late or it's too difficult. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of like the case, right? So, and number three, it's always that you, they really don't have the challenge. They don't have the, the, the people to, to take these kind of bold moves. And they're not empowered to do that, to be fair, because most of these service design ideas are not proven. And large companies operate on, you know, show me the data, show me the evidence. So, if imagine if you are proposing to the board to start a new business where I propose um, that every young woman should jump into a stranger's car and ride home. <laughs> no one wants to do that. Too dangerous. I believe that we should travel around the world and stay in some stranger's home. Mm. Basically, you can do research, but mm. I'll tell you no, nobody buys it. Mm. And what happened? Every millennial loves these products and, and because they think this is the best thing ever. So how would the company make decisions when every data point telling you no, no, and no? Yeah, it can't be done until it's proven that it's done, right? That's, uh, so, but this makes me kind of somewhere pessimistic that, uh, you know, all the big companies who are out there, can we help them or should we, you know, are, are they lost? It, it, how do we move forward with them? We, we can't only be working for the Airbnbs and the Ubers of this world, right? We have, we have no. the, the giant factories. The, the yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that they, they come to a point in time that they will respond and they have to respond. I think the way they respond will be a bit different. I think they will come up with their own smart companies will come up. They won't, I don't think they should do the same. I think they should think about, well, if that model is being approved, and people don't mind doing all these things. That's kind of new behavioral shift out there. And they say, well, how do we benefit from that with our scale, with our assets, with our people? So you can attack the problem very differently. Mm. You should let those people do the new things. And when they're successful, I have two options. Either I write a check to buy them, or I'm going to respond to them by designing our own version, which have the power of support from our assets or, you know, as a large company. Um, I think they do stand a chance if they can move fast enough and get into the pace of that because um, the market is constantly shifting. Um, the, 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 the Ubers of the world will hit their own problems at yeah, some point. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so large companies will come and say, look, these are their pain points. So I'm going to out uh, game, I'm going to out strategy them to think about what are the things that actually can beat them. So it, you're constantly fighting. I think I think large companies should utilize service design more um, as a respond um, a weapon to the threat of many um, startups. What have you found um, to be the most successful approach when talking to board level members and trying to get them to embrace this? new mindset what, what works is, is, is it is it is it indoctrinating yeah. fear with them <laughs> or well, it's always the same formula right and fear dry things happen because everybody feel like they're not reacting to it somehow they're responsible fear so you orchestrate that fear you, <laughs> you kind of amplify that fear and the second one to show them uh, the economics of that that always that you know how does it implicate the earnings and the third one to show them a roadmap from here to there. Right. Because right. I think that if you show people, look, that's the future. 
But the future has nothing to do with us. Then you're not saying anything because you're saying, okay, well, this is us today, and that's the future, and you're saying that we become so irrelevant. Mm-hmm. So you need to connect the future to the present. Mm-hmm. What you're doing today, one of the few important decisions that you make today will actually help you to be part of that future. Mm-hmm. So those three things, and people will listen. And, and that last thing is, a, is a really a golden tip because that builds confidence that they can actually do this, right? If done right. well. They need to be part of this. Like, if they cannot do it, then why are they thinking about this? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, so those are the three things that always work. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, we're sort of heading towards the end of this, uh, this episode, but I want to give you the chance to ask me and the people who are watching and listening to this episode uh, a question. So it, is there something you'd like to know from us? Mm. So... Mm. Okay, um, I'm, I'm curious about thinking about the service design is a very community driven, bottom driven. And I want to know how our fellow practitioners is responding to the threat of more automation through AI and bots, because that's one of the, the most um, easily deployable path is to put these service bot into customer service. And that's actually, it's pushed automation to a sort of a new level. So I'm curious to think about how service designers think about that threat. Interesting. How are you thinking about the threat of AI or the chances? That has been a question on the show uh, in a few earlier episodes, so it's really interesting to see how this develops. Mm-hmm. Uh, Idris, before we forget, we're doing a giveaway. Uh, of your book, we're doing a giveaway of two books. So a lucky person uh, can win a copy of Design Thinking for Strategic Innovation and your other book or written by your... Uh, yeah, another book on, on Generation Z, yes. And it, th- these, so will be gonna... si- these will be signed copies, right? That's really yeah, important. So uh, um, you've got a question for us and people need to leave a comment here on, uh, on the video and in two weeks time we'll pick a random winner who got the right answer. So what's the question, Idris? Okay, let me think for one second. Okay, so the book, the design thinking books, um, it was designed based on material that I designed for a school program. Um, so name me that school. And you got two autograph copies. Oh, at least you're getting, you're making a chance to win one of the, <laughs> one of the copies. So leave a comment and uh, to the to the question Idris just posted. Thank you very much, Idris. Uh, it was awesome having you on the show and being able to pick your brain and listening uh, to all your golden tips. Thanks so much. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you give it a thumbs up. And if you know someone who might benefit from the things we've just discussed, make sure you share this episode with them. If you'd like to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to the Service Design Show University at learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.